Chapter fourteen of The Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe DeNoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Twix Love and Duty. For an hour, Barbara Harding paced the veranda of the ranch house, pride and love battling for ascendancy within her breast. She could not let him die, that she knew. But how might she save him? The strains of music and the laughter from the bunkhouse had ceased. The ranch slept. Over the brow on the low bluff, upon the opposite side of the river, a little party of silent horsemen filed downward to the ford. At the bluff's foot, a barbed wire fence marked the eastern boundary of the ranch's enclosed fields. The foremost horsemen dismounted and cut the strands of wire, carrying them to one side from the path of the feet of the horses which now passed through the opening he had made. Down into the river they rode, following the ford even in the darkness, with an assurance which indicated long familiarity. Then, through a fringe of willows out across a meadow toward the ranch buildings, the riders made their way. The manner of their approach, their utter silence, the hour, all contributed toward the sinister. Upon the veranda of the ranch house, Barbara Harding came to a sudden halt. Her entire manner indicated final decision and determination. A moment she stood in thought, and then ran quickly down the steps in the direction of the office. Here she found Eddie dozing at his post. She did not disturb him. A glance through the window satisfied her that he was alone with the prisoner. From the office building, Barbara passed on to the corral. A few horses stood within the enclosure, their heads drooping dejectedly. As she entered, they raised their muzzles and sniffed suspiciously, ears a cock. And as the girl approached closer to them, they moved warily away, snorting and passing around her to the opposite side of the corral. As they moved by her, she scrutinized them and her heart dropped, for Brazos was not among them. He must have been turned out into the pasture. She passed over to the bars that closed the opening from the corral into the pasture and wormed her way between two of them. A hackamore with a piece of halter rope attached to it hung across the upper bar. Taking it down, she moved off across the pasture in the direction the saddle horses most often took when liberated from the corral. If they had not crossed the river, she felt that she might find and catch Brazos, for lumps of sugar and bits of bread had inspired in his equine soul a wondrous attachment for his temporary mistress. Down the beaten trail the animals had made to the river, the girl hurried, her eyes penetrating the darkness ahead, into either hand for the looming bulks that would be the horses she sought, and among which she might hope to discover the gentle little Brazos. The nearer she came to the river, the lower dropped her spirits, for as yet no sign of the animals was to be seen. To have attempted to place a hackamore upon any of the wild creatures in the corral would have been the height of foolishness. Only a well-sped riata in the hands of a strong man could have captured one of those, Closer and closer to the fringe of willows along the river she came, until, at their very edge, there broke upon her already taut nerves the hideous and uncanny scream of a wildcat. The girl stopped short in her tracks. She felt the chill of fear creep through her skin, and the twitching at the roots of her hair evidenced to her the extremity of her terror. Should she turn back? The horses might be between her and the river, but judgment told her that they had crossed. Should she brave the nervous fright of a passage through that dark, forbidding labyrinth of gloom when she knew that she would not find the horses within reach beyond? She turned to retrace her steps. She must find another way. But was there another way? And tomorrow they will shoot him. She shuddered, bit her lower lip in an effort to command her courage, and then, wheeling, plunged into the thicket. Again the cat screamed, close by. But the girl never hesitated in her advance, and a few moments later she broke through the willows a dozen paces from the river bank. Her eyes strained through the night, but no horses were to be seen. The trail, cut by the hoofs of many animals, ran deep and straight down into the swirling water. Upon the opposite side, Brazos must be feeding or resting, just beyond reach. Barbara dug her nails into her palms in the bitterness of her disappointment. She followed down to the very edge of the water. It was black and forbidding. Even in the daytime, she would not have been confident of following the ford. By night, it would be madness to attempt it. She choked down a sob. Her shoulders drooped. Her head bent forward. She was the picture of disappointment and despair. What can I do, she moaned. Tomorrow they will shoot him. The thought seemed to electrify her. They shall not shoot him, she cried aloud. They shall not shoot him while I live to prevent it. Again her head was up and her shoulders squared. Tying the hackamore about her waist, she took a single deep breath of reassurance and stepped out into the river. For a dozen paces she found no difficulty in following the ford. It was broad and straight, but toward the center of the river, as she felt her way along a step at a time, she came to a place where directly before her the ledge upon which she crossed shelved off into deep water. She turned upward, trying to locate the direction of the new turn, but here, too, there was no footing. 
Down river she felt solid rock beneath her feet. Ah, this was the way, and boldly she stepped out, the water already above her knees. Two, three steps she took, and with each one her confidence and hope arose, and then the fourth step, and there was no footing. She felt herself lunging into the stream, and tried to draw back and regain the ledge, but the force of the current was too much for her, and so suddenly it seemed that she had thrown herself in, she was in the channel swimming for her life. The trend of the current there was back in the direction of the bank she had but just quitted, yet so strong was her determination to succeed for Billy Byrne's sake that she turned her face toward the opposite shore and fought to reach the seemingly impossible goal which love had set for her. Again and again she was swept under by the force of the current. Again and again she rose in battle, not for her own life, but for the life of the man she once had loathed and whom she had later come to love. Inch by inch she won toward the shore of her desire, and inch by inch of her progress she felt her strength failing. Could she win? Ah, if she were but a man, and with the thought came another. Thank God that I am a woman, with a woman's love, which gives strength to drive me in the clutches of death for his sake. Her heart thundered in tumultuous protest against the strain of her panting lungs. Her limbs felt cold and numb, but she could not give up, even though she was now convinced that she had thrown her life away uselessly. They would find her body, but no one would ever guess what had driven her to her death. Not even he would know that it was for his sake and then she felt the tugging of the channel current suddenly lessen, and Eddie carried her gently inshore. Her feet touched the sand and gravel of the bottom. Gasping for breath, staggering, stumbling, she reeled on a few paces and then slipped down, clutching at the river's bank. Here the water was shallow, and here she lay until her strength returned. Then she urged herself up and onward, climbed to the top of the bank with success at last within reach. To find the horses now required but a few minutes' search. They stood huddled in a black mass close to the barbed wire fence at the extremity of the pasture. As she approached them, they commenced to separate slowly, edging away while they faced her in curiosity. Softly she called, Brazos, come Brazos, until a unit of the moving mass detached itself and came toward her, nickering. Good Brazos, she cooed. That's a good pony, and walked forward to meet him. The animal let her reach up and stroke his forehead, while he muzzled about her for the expected tidbit. Gently she worked the hackamore over his nose and above his ears, and when it was safely in place she breathed a deep sigh of relief and, throwing her arms about his neck, pressed her cheek into his. "'You dear old Brazos,' she whispered. The horse stood quietly while the girl wriggled herself to his back, and then at a word and a touch from her heels moved off at a walk in the direction of the ford. The crossing this time was one of infinite ease, for Barbara let the rope lie loose and Brazos take his own way. Through the willows upon the opposite bank, he shouldered his path across the meadow, still at a walk, lest they arouse attention, and through a gate which led directly from the meadow into the ranch yard. Here she tied him to the outside of the corral, while she went in search of saddle and bridle. Whose she took she did not know, nor care, but that the saddle was enormously heavy she was perfectly aware, long before she had dragged it halfway to where Brazos stood. Three times she essayed to lift it to his back before she succeeded in accomplishing the Herculean task and had it been any other horse upon the ranch than Brazos, the thing could never have been done. But the kindly little pony stood in statuesque resignation while the heavy Mexican tree was banged and thumping against his legs and ribs, until the lucky swing carried it to his withers. Saddled and bridled, Barbara led him to the rear of the building, and thus, by a roundabout way, to the back of the office building. Here she could see a light in the room in which Billy was confined, and after dropping the bridle reins to the ground, she made her way to the front of the structure. Creeping stealthily to the porch, she peered in at the window. Eddie was stretched out and cramped though seeming luxury in an office chair. His feet were cocked up on a desk before him. In his lap lay his six-shooter, ready for an emergency. Another reposed in his holster at his belt. Barbara tiptoed to the door, holding her breath. She turned the knob gently. The door swung open without a sound, and an instant later she stood within the room. Again her eyes were fixed upon Eddie Shorter. She saw his nerveless fingers relax their hold upon the grip of his revolver. She saw the weapon slip further down into his lap. He did not move, other than to the deep and regular breathing of profound slumber. Barbara crossed to his side. Behind the ranch house, three figures crept forward in the shadows. Behind them, a matter of a hundred yards, stood a little clump of horses, and with them were the figures of more men. These waited in silence. The other three crept toward the house. It was such a ranch house as you might find by the scores of hundreds throughout Texas. Grayson, evidently, or some other Texan, had designed it. There was nothing Mexican about it, nor anything beautiful. It stood two-storied, verandahed, and hideous, a blot upon the soil of picturesque Mexico. 
To the roof of the veranda clambered the three prowlers, and across it to an open window. The window belonged to the bedroom of Miss Barbara Harding. Here they paused and listened, and two of them entered the room. They were gone for but a few minutes. When they emerged they showed evidences, by their gestures to the third man who had waited outside, of disgust and disappointment. Cautiously they descended as they had come, and made their way back to those other men who had remained with the horses. Here they ensued a low-toned conference, and while it progressed, Barbara Harding reached forth a steady hand, which belied the terror in her soul, and plucked the revolver from Eddie Shorter's lap. Eddie slept on. Again on tiptoe, the girl recrossed the office to the locked door leading to the back room. The key was in the lock. Gingerly she turned it, keeping a furtive eye upon the sleeping guard, and the muzzle of his own revolver leveled menacingly upon him. Eddie Shorter stirred in his sleep and raised the hand to his face. The heart of Barbara Harding ceased to beat while she stood waiting for the man to open his eyes and discover her, but he did nothing of the kind. Instead, his hand dropped limply to his side and resumed his regular breathing. The key turned in the lock beneath the gentle pressure of her fingers. The bolt slipped quietly back, and she pushed the door ajar. Within, Billy Burton turned, inquiring eyes in the direction of the opening door, and as he saw who it was who entered, surprise showed upon his face, but he spoke no word, for the girl held a silencing finger to her lips. Quickly she came to his side, and motioned to him to rise while she tugged the knots which held the bonds in place about his arms. Once she stopped long enough to recross the room and close the door which she had left open when she entered. It required fully five minutes, the longest five minutes of Barbara Harding's life, she thought, before the knots gave to her efforts. But at last the rope fell to the floor, and Billy Byrne was free. He started to speak, to thank her, and perhaps to scold her for the rash thing she had undertaken for him, but she silenced him again with a whispered, Come! turned toward the door. As she opened the crack to Rick in order, she kept the revolver pointed straight ahead of her into the adjoining room. Eddie, however, still slept on in peaceful ignorance of the trick which had been played upon him. Now the two started forward for the door which opened from the office upon the porch, and as they did so, Barbara turned again toward Billy to caution him to silence, for his spurs had tinkled as he moved. For a moment their eyes were not upon Eddie shorter, and fate had it that at that very moment Eddie awoke and opened his eyes. The sight that had met them was so astonishing that for a second the Kansan could not move. He saw Barbara Harding, a revolver in her hand, aiding the outlaw to escape, and in the instant that surprise kept him motionless, Eddie saw, too, another picture, the picture of a motherly woman in a little farmhouse back in Kansas, and Eddie realized that this man, this outlaw, had been the means of arousing within him a desire and a determination to return again to those loving arms. Two, the man had saved his mother from injury and possible death. Eddie shut his eyes quickly and thought hard and fast. Miss Barbara had always been kind to him, and his boyish heart he had loved her, hopelessly, of course, in a boyish way. She wanted the outlaw to escape. Eddie realized that he would do anything that Miss Barbara wanted, even if he had risked his life at it. The girl and the man were at the door. She pushed him through ahead of her while she kept the revolver leveled upon Eddie. Then she passed out after him and closed the door, while Eddie Shorter kept his eyes tightly closed and prayed to his God that Billy Byrne might get safely away. Outside and in the rear of the office building, Barbara pressed the revolver upon Billy. You will need it, she said. There is Brazos. Take him. God bless and guard you, Billy, and she was gone. Billy swallowed hard. He wanted to run after her and take her in his arms, but he recalled Bridge, and with a sigh turned toward the patient Brazos. Languidly he gathered up the reins and mounted, and then, unconcernedly as though he were an honored guest departing by daylight, he rode out of the ranch yard and turned Brazos' head north up the river road and as Billy disappeared in the darkness toward the north, Barbara Harding walked slowly toward the ranch house, while from a little group of men and horses a hundred yards away, three men detached themselves and crept toward her, for they had seen her in the moonlight as she left Billy outside the office and strolled slowly in the direction of the house. They hid in the shadow at the side of the house until the girl had turned the corner and was approaching the veranda. Then they ran quickly forward, and as she mounted the steps she was seized from behind and dragged backwards. A hand was clapped over her mouth, and a whispering threat warned her to silence. Half dragging and half carrying her, the three men bore her back to where their confederates waited them. A huge fellow mounted his pony, and Barbara was lifted to the horn of the saddle before him. Then the others mounted, and as silently as they had come, they rode away, following the same path. Barbara Harding had not cried out, nor attempted to, for she had seen very shortly after her capture that she was in the hands of Indians, and she judged from what she had heard of the little band of Pimans who held forth in the mountains to the east that they would as gladly knife her as not. Jose was a Piedmont, and she immediately connected Jose with the perpetration, or at least the planning, of her abduction. Thus she felt assured that no harm would come to her, since Jose had been famous in his time for the number and size of the ransoms he collected. 
Her father would pay what was demanded. She would be returned, and, aside from a few days of discomfort and hardship, she would be none the worse off for her experience. Reasoning thus, it was not difficult to maintain her composure and presence of mind. As Barbara was born toward the east, Billy Byrne rode steadily northward. It was his intention to stop at Jose's hut and deliver the message which Pesita had given him for the old Canadian. Then he would disappear into the mountains to the west, join Pesita and urge a new raid upon some favored friend of General Francisco Villa, for Billy had no love for Villa. He should have been glad to pay his respects to El Robo Rancho and its foreman, but the fact that Anthony Harding owned it and that he and Barbara were there was sufficient effectually to banish all thoughts of revenge along that line. Maybe I can get his goat later, he thought, when he's away from the ranch. I don't like that stiff anyhow. He ought to have been a harness bull. It was four o'clock in the morning when Billy dismounted in front of Jose's hut. He pounded on the door until the man came and opened it. Hey, exclaimed Jose as he saw who his early morning visitor was. You got away from them. Fine, and the old man chuckled. I sent word to Pesita two, four hours ago that Villist has captured Captain Byrne and taken him to Cuivaca. Thanks, said Billy. Pesita wants you to send Esteban to him. I didn't have no chance to tell you last night when them pikers were sticking around, so I stops now on my way back to the hills. I will send Esteban tonight if I can get him, but I do not know. Esteban is working for the pig, Grayson. What's he doing for Grayson? asked Billy. And what was that Grayson guy doing up here with you, Jose? Ain't you getting pretty thick with Pesita's enemies? Jose, good friends, everybody, said the old man, grinning. Grayson have a job he want good men for. Jose furnish men. Grayson pay well. Job got nothing to do with Peseta, Villa, Carranza, Revolution. Just private job. Grayson wants Senorita. He pay to get her, that all. Oh, said Billy, and yawned. He was not interested in Mr. Grayson's amours. Why didn't the poor boob go get her himself? He inquired disinterestedly. He must be a yap to hire a bunch of guys to go cop off a swish girl for him. It is not a swish girl, senor captain, said Jose. It is one beautiful senorita, the daughter of the owner of El Robo Rancho. What? cried Billy. What did you say? Yes, senor captain. What of it? inquired Jose. Grayson, he pay me furnish the men. Esteban, he go with his warriors. I get Esteban. They go tonight, take away the senorita, but not for Grayson. And the old fellow laughed. I can no help, can I? Grayson pay me money, get men. I get them. I no help if they keep girl. And he shrugged. They're coming for her tonight, cried Billy. Si, sí, senor, replied Jose. Doubtless they already take her. Hell, muttered Billy Byrne as he swung Brazos about so quickly that the little pony pivoted upon his hind legs and dashed away toward the south over the same trail he had just traversed. End of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of *The Return of the Mucker* by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. An Indian's Treachery. The Brazos pony had traveled far that day, but for only a trifle over ten miles had he carried a rider upon his back. He was consequently far from fagged as he leapt forward to the lifted reins and tore along the dusty river trail back in the direction of Arobo. Never before had Brazos covered ten miles in so short a time, for it was not yet five o'clock when, reeling with fatigue, he stopped, staggered, and fell in front of the office building at El Robo. Eddie Shorter had sat in the chair as Barbara and Billy had last seen him, waiting until Byrne should have an ample start before rousing Grayson and reporting the prisoner's escape. Eddie had determined that he would give Billy an hour. He grinned as he anticipated the rage of Grayson and the Villistas when they learned that their bird had flown, and as he mused and waited, he fell asleep. It was broad daylight when Eddie awoke, and as he looked up at the little clock ticking against the wall and saw the time, he gave an exclamation of surprise and leapt to his feet. Just as he opened the outer door of the office, he saw a horseman leap from a winded pony in front of the building. He saw the animal collapse and sink to the ground, and then he recognized the pony as Brazos, and another glance at the man brought recognition of him, too. You, cried Eddie, what are you doing back here? I gotta take you now and he started to draw his revolver, but Billy Byrne had him covered before ever his hand reached the grip of the gun. "'Put him up,' admonished Billy, and listen to me. This ain't no time for gunplay and no such foolishness. I ain't back here to be took. Get that out of your nut. I'm tipped off that a bunch of swishes is down here last night to swipe Miss Harding. Come, we gotta go see if she's here or not, and don't try any funny business on me, Eddie. I ain't a-going to be taken again, and whoever tries it gets his. See?' Eddie was down off the porch in an instant and making for the ranch house. "'I'm with you,' he said. "'Who told you? And who done it? Never mind who told me, but a swish named Esteban was to pull the thing off for Grayson, 
Grayson wanted Miss Harding, and he was going to have her stolen for him. The hound, muttered Eddie. The two men dashed up onto the veranda of the ranch house and pounded at the door until a Chinaman opened it and stuck his head out inquiringly. Is Miss Harding here? demanded Billy. Blissy Hardy Cleep, snapped the servant. Wally Wani here flow breakfast? and would have shut the door in their faces had not Billy intruded the heavy boot. The next instant he placed a large palm over the celestial's face and pushed the man back into the house. Once inside he called Mr. Harding's name aloud. "'What is it?' asked the gentleman a moment later as he appeared in the bedroom doorway off the living room, clad in his pajamas. "'What's the matter?' "'Why, gad, man, is that really you? Is this really Billy Byrne?' "'Sure,' replied Billy shortly. "'But we can't waste any time chinning.' I heard that Miss Barbara was going to be swiped last night. I heard that she had been. Now hurry and see if she's here. Anthony Harding turned and leapt up the narrow stairwell to the second floor four steps at a time. He hadn't gone upstairs in that fashion in forty years. Without even pausing to rap, he burst into his daughter's bedroom. It was empty. The bed was unruffled. It had not been slept in. With a moan, the man turned back and ran hastily to the other rooms upon the second floor. Barbara was nowhere to be found. Then he hastened downstairs to the two men awaiting him. As he entered the room from one end, Grayson entered it from the other through the doorway leading up upon the veranda. Billy Byrne had heard footsteps upon the boards without, and he was ready, so that as Grayson entered he found himself looking straight at the business end of a six-shooter. The foreman halted, and stood looking in surprise first at Billy Byrne, and then at Eddie Shorter and Mr. Harding. "'What does this mean?' he demanded, addressing Eddie. "'What you doing here with your prisoner? Who told you to let him out, eh?' "'Can the chatter,' growled Billy Byrne. "'Shorter didn't let me out. I skipped hours ago, and I've just come back from Jose's to ask you where Miss Harding is. You low-lived cur, you. Where is she?' "'What has Mr. Grayson to do with it?' asked Mr. Harding. "'How should he know anything about it? It's all a mystery to me. You here, of all the men in the world, and Grayson talking about you as a prisoner. I can't make it out. Quick, though, Byrne, tell me what you know about Barbara.' Billy kept Grayson covered as he replied to the request of Harding. This guy hires a bunch of Pimans to steal Miss Barbara, he said. I got it straight from the fellow he paid the money to for getting him the right men to pull off the job. He wants her, it seems, and Billy shot a look at the ranch foreman that would have killed if it looks good. She can't have been gone long. I seen her after midnight just before I made my getaway, so they can't have taken her very far. This thing here can't help us none neither, for he don't know where she is any more than we do. He thinks he does, but he don't. The switch has framed it on him, and they've double-crossed him. I got that straight, too. But, God, I don't know where they've taken her and what they're going to do to her. As he spoke, he turned his face for the first time away from Grayson and looked full in Anthony Harding's face. The latter saw beneath the strong character lines of the man's countenance the agony of fear and doubt that lay heavily upon his heart. In the brief instance that Billy Watchful gaze left the figure of the ranch foreman, the latter saw the opportunity he craved. He was standing directly in the doorway. A single step would carry him out of range of Byrne's gun placing a wall between it and him, and Grayson was not slow in taking that step. When Billy turned his eyes back, the Texan had disappeared, and by the time the former reached the doorway, Grayson was halfway to the office building on the veranda, of which stood the four soldiers of Villa, grumbling and muttering over the absence of their prisoner of the previous evening. Billy Byrne stepped out into the open. The ranch foreman called aloud to the four Mexicans that their prisoner was at the ranch house, and they looked in that direction they saw him, revolver in hand, coming slowly toward them. There was a smile upon his lips which they could not see because of the distance, and which, not knowing Billy Byrne, they would not have interpreted correctly. But the revolver they did understand. And at the sight of it, one of them threw his carbine to his shoulder. His finger, however, never closed upon the trigger, for there came the sound of a shot from beyond Billy Byrne, and the Mexican staggered forward, pitching over the edge of the porch to the ground. Billy turned his head in the direction from which the shot had come and saw Eddie Shorter running toward him, a smoking six-shooter in his right hand. Go back, commanded Byrne. This is my funeral. Not in your life, replied Eddie Shorter. Those greasers don't take no white man off an El Robo while I'm here. Get busy. They're coming. And sure enough, they were coming. And as they came, their carbines popped and the bolts whizzed about the heads of the two Americans. Grayson, too, had taken a hand upon the side of the Vistas. From the bunkhouse, other men were running rapidly in the direction of the fight, attracted by the first shots. Billy and Eddie stood their ground a few paces apart. Two more of Villa's men went down. Grayson ran for cover. Then Billy Byrne dropped the last of the Mexicans, just as the men from the bunkhouse came panting upon the scene. They were both Americans and Mexicans among them. All were armed and weapons were ready in their hands. They paused a short distance from the two men. 
Eddie's presence upon the side of the stranger saved Billy from instant death, for Eddie was well liked by both his Mexican and American fellow workers. "'What's the fuss?' asked an American. Eddie told them, and when they learned that their boss's daughter had been spirited away, that the ranch foreman was at the bottom of it, the anger of the Americans rose to a dangerous pitch. "'Where is he?' someone asked. They were gathered in a little cluster now about Billy Byrne and Shorter. "'I saw him duck behind the office building,' said Eddie. "'Come on,' said another. "'We'll get him.' "'Someone get a rope.' The men spoke in low, ordinary tones. They appeared unexcited. Determination was the most apparent characteristic of the group. One of them ran back toward the bunkhouse for his rope. The others walked slowly in the direction of the rear of the office building. Grayson was not there. The search proceeded. The Americans were in advance. The Mexicans kept in a group by themselves, a little in the rear of the others. It was not their trouble. If the gringos wanted to lynch another gringo, well and good. That was the gringos' business. They would keep out of it, and they did. Down past the bunkhouse and the cookhouse to the stables, the searchers made their way. Grayson could not be found. In the stables, one of the men made a discovery. The foreman's saddle had vanished. Out in the corrals they went. One of the men laughed. The bars were down and the saddle horses gone. Eddie Shorter presently pointed out across the pasture and the river to the skyline of the low bluffs beyond. The others looked. A horseman was just visible, urging his mount upward to the crest. The two stood in silhouette against the morning sky, pink with the new sun. That's him, said Eddie. Let him go, said Billy Byrne. He won't never come back, and he ain't worth chasing. Not while we got Miss Barbara to look after. My horse is down there with yours. I'm going down to get him. Will you come shorter? I may need help. I ain't much with a rope yet. He started off without waiting for a reply, and all the Americans followed. Together they circled the horses and drove them back to the corral. When Billy had saddled and mounted, he saw that the others had done likewise. We're going with you, said one of them. Miss Barbara belongs to us. Billy nodded and moved off in the direction of the ranch house. Here he dismounted, and with Eddie Shorter and Mr. Harding, commenced circling the house in search of some manner of clue to the direction taken by the abductors. It was not long before they came upon the spot where the Indians' horses had stood the night before. From there the trail led plainly down toward the river. In a moment ten Americans were following after it. Mr. Harding had supplied Billy Byrne with a carbine, another six-shooter, and ammunition. Through the river and the cut in the barbed wire fence, then up the face of the bluff and out across the low mesa beyond, the trail led. For a mile it was distinct, and then disappeared as though the riders had separated. Well, said Billy, as the others drew around him for consolation, they'd be going to the hills there. They were peons, Esteban's tribe. They got her up there in the hills somewheres. Let's split up and search the hills for her. Whoever comes on them first will have to do some shooting, and the rest of us can close in and help. We can go in pairs, then if one's killed, the other can ride out and lead the way back to where it happened. The men seemed satisfied with the plan and broke up into parties of two. Eddie Shorter paired off with Billy Byrne. Spread out, said the latter to his companions. Eddie and I'll ride straight ahead. The rest of you can fan out a few miles on either side of us. So long and good luck. And he started off toward the hills, Eddie Shorter at his side. Back at the ranch, the Mexican vaqueros lounged about, grumbling. With no foreman, there was nothing to do except talk about their troubles. They had not been paid since the looting of the bank at Provaca, for Mr. Harding had been unable to get any silver from anywhere else until a few days since. He now had assurances that it was on the way to him, but whether or not it would reach El Robo was a question. "'Why should we stay here when we are not paid?' asked one of them. "'Yes, why?' chorused several others. "'There's nothing to do here,' said another. "'We would go to Covaca. I, for one, am tired of working for the gringos.' This met with unqualified approval of all, and a few moments later the men had saddled their ponies and were galloping away in the direction of sun-baked Covaca. They sang now, and were happy, for they were as little boys playing hooky from school. Not bad men, but rather irresponsible children. Once in Covaca, they swooped down upon the drinking place, where, with what little money a few of them had left, they proceeded to get drunk. Later in the day, an old, dried-up Indian entered. He was hot and dusty from a long ride. "'Hey, Jose!' cried one of the vaqueros from El Arobo Rancho. "'You old rascal, what are you doing here?' Jose looked around upon them. He knew them all. They represented the Mexican contingent of the riders of El Arobo. Jose wondered what they were all doing here in Covaca at one time. Even upon a payday, it never had been a rule of the El Arobo to allow more than four men at a time to come to town. "'Oh, Jose, come to buy coffee and tobacco,' he replied. He looked about searchingly. "'Where are the others?' he asked. "'The gringos.' They have ridden after Esteban, explained one of the vaqueros. He has run off with Senorita Harding. Jose raised his eyebrows, as though this was all news. And Senor Grayson has gone with them, he asked. He was very fond of the Senorita. 
Senior Grayson has run away, went on the other speaker. The other gringos wish to hang him, for it is said that he has bribed Esteban to do this thing. Again, Jose raised his eyebrows. Impossible, he ejaculated. And who then guards the ranch? he asked presently. Senor Harding, two Mexican house servants, and a Chinaman, and the vaquero laughed. I must be going, Jose announced after a moment. It is a long ride for an old man from my poor home to Povaca and back again. The vaqueros were paying no further attention to him, and the Indian passed out and sought his pony, but when he had mounted and ridden from town, he took a strange direction for one whose path lies to the east, since he turned the pony's head toward the northwest. Jose had ridden far that day, since Billy had left his humble hut. He had gone to the west to the little rancho of one of Peseta's adherents, who had dispatched a boy to carry word to the bandit that his captain Byrne had escaped the Vistas, and then Jose had ridden into Covaca by a circuitous route which brought him up from the east side of the town. Now he was riding once again for Peseta, but this time he would bear the information himself. He found the chief in camp, and after baking tobacco and cigarette paper, the Indian finally reached the purpose of the visit. Jose has just come from Covaca, he said, and there he drank with all the Mexican vaqueros in El Arobo Rancho. All, a general. You understand? It seems that Esteban has carried off the beautiful senorito of El Arobo Rancho, and the vaqueros tell Jose that all the American vaqueros have ridden in search of her. All, my general. You understand? In such times of danger, it is odd that the gringos should leave El Arobo thus unguarded. Only the rich senor Harding, two house servants, and a Chinaman remained. A man lay stretched upon his blankets in a tent next to that occupied by Peseta. At the sound of the speaker's voice, low though it was, he raised his head and listened. He heard every word, and a scowl settled upon his brow. Barbara stolen? Mr. Harding practically alone upon the ranch? And Peseta in possession of this information? Bridge rose to his feet. He buckled his cartridge belt upon his waist and picked up his carbine. And he crawled under the rear wall of the tent and walked slowly off in the direction of the picket line, where the horses were tethered. Ah, Senor Bridge, said a pleasant voice in his ear. Where to? Bridge turned quickly to look into the smiling, evil face of Rosales. Oh, he replied, I'm going out to see if I can't find some shooting. It's awfully dull sitting around here doing nothing. See, si, Senor, agreed Rosales. I, too, find it so. Let us go together. I know where the shooting is best. I don't doubt it, thought Bridge. Probably in the back. But aloud, he said, certainly that will be fine. For he guessed that Rosales had been set to watch his movements and prevent his escape. And perchance to be the sole witness of some unhappy event which should carry senor bridge to the arms of his father rosales called a soldier to saddle and bridled their horses and shortly after the two were riding abreast down the trail out of the hills where it was necessary that they ride in single file bridge was careful to see that rosales rode ahead and the mexican graciously permitted the american to fall behind if he was inspired by any other motive than simply espionage he was evidently content to bide his time until chance gave him the opening he desired and it was equally evident that he felt as safe in front of the American as behind him. At a point where a ravine down which they had ridden debauched upon a mesa, Rosales suggested that they ride to the north, which was not at all in the direction in which Bridge intended them going. The American demurred. There is no shooting down in the valley, urged Rosales. I think there will be, was Bridge's enigmatic reply, and then, with a sudden exclamation of surprise, he pointed over Rosales' shoulder. What's that? he cried, in a voice tense with excitement. The Mexican turned his head quickly in the direction Bridge's index finger indicated. I see nothing, said Rosales after a moment. You do now, though, replied Bridge, and as the Mexican's eyes were turned in the direction of his companion, he was forced to admit that he did see something, the dismal hollow eye of a six-shooter looking at him straight in the face. Senor Bridge, exclaimed Rosales, what are you doing? What do you mean? I mean, said Bridge, that if you are all solicitous to your health, you'll climb down off that pony, not forgetting to keep your hands above your head when you reach the ground. Now climb. Rosales dismounted. Turn your back toward me, commanded the American. When the other had obeyed him, Bridge dismounted and removed the man's weapons from his belt. Now you may go, Rosales, he said, and should you ever have an American in your power again, remember that I spared your life when I may easily have taken it, when it would have been infinitely safer for me to have done it. The Mexican made no reply, but the black scowl that clouded his face boded ill for the next gringo who should be so unfortunate as to fall into his hands. Slowly he wheeled about and started back up the trail in the direction of Peseta's camp. I'll be halfway to El Arobo, thought Bridge, before he gets a chance to tell Peseta what happened to him, and then he remounted and rode on down into the valley, leading Rosales' horse behind him. It would never do, he knew, to turn the animal loose too soon, since he would doubtless make his way back to camp, and in doing so would have to pass Rosales, who would then catch him. Time was what Bridge wanted, 
to be well on his way to Orobo before Pesita should learn of his escape. Bridge knew nothing of what had happened to Billy, for Pesita had seen to it that the information was kept from the American. The latter had, nevertheless, been worrying not a little at the absence of his friend, for he knew that he had taken his liberty and his life in his hands in riding down to El Orobo among avowed enemies. Far to his rear, Rosales plodded sullenly up the steep trail through the mountains, revolving in his mind various exquisite tortures he should be delightful in inflicting upon the next gringo who came into his power. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of The Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Eddie Makes Good. Billy Byrne and Eddie Shorter rode steadily in the direction of the hills. Upon either side, at intervals of a mile or more, stretched the others of their party, occasionally visible, but for the most part, not. Once in the hills, the two could no longer see their friends or be seen by them. Both Byrne and Eddie felt that chance had placed them upon the right trail, for a well-marked and long-used path wound upward through the canyon along which they rode. It was an excellent location for an ambush, and both men breathed more freely when they had passed out of it into more open country, upon a narrow tableland between the first foothills and the main range of mountains. Here again was the trail well-marked, and when Eddie, looking ahead, saw that it appeared to lead in the direction of a vivid green spot close to the base of the gray-brown hills, he gave an exclamation of assurance. "'We're on the right trail, all right, old man,' he said. "'They's water there,' and he pointed ahead at the green splotch upon the gray. "'That's where they be having their village. I ain't never been up here, so I ain't familiar with the country. You see, we don't run no cattle this side of the river. The Pimans won't let us. They don't care to have no white men poking around in their country, and I'll bet a hat we find a camp there.' Onward they rode toward the little spot of green. Sometimes it was in sight, and again as they approached higher ground, or wound through gullies and ravines, it was lost to their sight. But always they kept it as their goal. The trail they were upon led to it. Of that there was no longer the slightest doubt. And as they rode, with their destination in view, black, beady eyes looked down upon them from the very green oasis toward which they urged their ponies, tiring now from the climb. A lithe brown body lay stretched comfortably upon a bed of grasses at the edge of a little rise of ground beneath which the riders must pass before they came to the cluster of huts which squatted in a tiny natural park at the foot of the main peak. Far above the watcher a spring of clear, pure water bubbled out of the mountainside, and running downward formed little pools among the rocks which held it, and with this water the Pimans irrigated their small fields before it sank from sight again to the earth just below the village. Beside the brown body lay a long rifle. The man's eyes watched, unblinking, the two specks far below him whom he knew he had known for an hour were gringos. Another brown body wormed itself forward to his side and peered over the edge of the declivity down upon the white man. He spoke a few words in a whisper to him who watched with the rifle, and then crawled back again and disappeared. And all the while, onward and upward came Billy Byrne and Eddie Shorter, each knowing in his heart that if not already, then at any moment a watcher would discover them, and a little later a bullet would fly that would find one of them. And they took the chance for the sake of the American girl who lay hidden somewhere in these hills, for in no other way could they locate her hiding place more quickly. Any one of the other eight Americans who rode in pairs into the hills at other points to the left and right of Billy Byrne and his companion would have, and was even then cheerfully taking the same chances that Eddie and Billy took, only the latter were now assured that one of them would fall to sacrifice, for as they came closer, Eddie had seen a thin wreath of smoke rising from among the trees of the oasis. Now, indeed, were they sure that they had chanced upon the trail to the Piman village. "'We gotta keep our eyes peeled,' said Eddie, as they wound into a ravine, which from its location evidently led directly up to the village. "'We ain't far from them now, and if they get us, they'll get us about here.' As though to punctuate his speech with the final period, a rifle cracked above them. Eddie jumped spasmodically and clutched his breast. "'I'm hit,' he said, quite unemotionally. Billy Byrne's revolver had answered the shot from above him, the bullet striking where Billy had seen a puff of smoke following the rifle shot. Then Billy turned toward Eddie. Hit bad, he asked. Yep, I guess so, said Eddie. What'll we do? Hide up here, or ride back after the others? Another shot rang out above them, although Billy had been watching for a target I wished to shoot again, a target which he had been positive he would get when the man rose to fire again. And Billy did see the fellow at last, a few paces from where he had last fired but not until the other had dropped at his horse beneath him. 
Byrne fired again, and this time he had the satisfaction of seeing a brown body rise, struggle a moment, and then roll over once upon the grass before it came to rest. "'I reckon we'll stay here,' said Billy, looking ruefully at Eddie's horse. Eddie rose, and as he did so he staggered and grew very white. Billy dismounted and ran forward, putting an arm about him. Another shot came from above, and Billy Byrne's pony grunted and collapsed. Hell, exclaimed Billy, we gotta get out of this, and lifting his wounded comrade in his arms, he ran for the shelter of the bluff from the summit of which the snipers had fired upon them. Close in, hugging the face of the perpendicular wall of the tumbled rock and earth, they were out of range of the Indians. But Billy did not stop when he had reached temporary safety. Further up toward the direction in which lay the village, and halfway up the side of the bluff, Billy saw what he took to be an excellent shelter. Here the face of the bluff was less steep, and upon it lay a number of large boulders, while others protruded from the ground about them. Toward these Billy made his way. The wounded man across his shoulder was suffering indescribable agonies, but he bit his lip and stifled the cries that each step his comrade took seemed to wrench from him, lest he attract the enemy to their position. Above them all was silence, yet Billy knew that alert, red foemen were creeping to the edge of the bluff in search of their prey. If he could but reach the shelter of the boulders before the Pimas discovered them, the minutes that were consumed in covering the hundred yards seemed as many hours to Billy Byrne, but at last he dragged the fainting cowboy between two large boulders close under the edge of the bluff and found himself in a little natural fortress, well adapted to defense. From above they were protected from the fire of the Indians upon the bluff by the height of the boulder at the foot of which they lay while another just in front hid them from possible marksmen across the canyon. Smaller rocks scattered about gave promise of shelter from flank fire, and as soon as he had deposited Eddie in the comparative safety of their retreat, Byrne commenced forming a low breastwork upon the side facing the village, the direction from which they might naturally expect attack. This done, he turned his attention to the opening upon the opposite side, and soon had a similar defense constructed there. Then he turned his attention to Eddie, though keeping a watchful eye upon both approaches to their stronghold. The Kansan lay upon his side, moaning. Blood stained his lips and nostrils, and when Billy Byrne opened his shirt and found a gaping wound in his right breast, he knew how serious was his companion's injury. As he felt Billy working over him, the boy opened his eyes. "'You think I'm done for?' he asked in a tortured whisper. "'Nothing doing,' lied Billy, cheerfully. "'Just a scratch. He'll be all right in a day or two. Eddie shook his head wearily. "'I wish I could believe you,' he said. I've been figuring on going back to see Ma. I ain't thought of nothing else since you told me about how she missed me. I can see her right now just like I was there. I bet she's scrubbing the kitchen floor. Ma was always a scrubbing something. Gee, but it's tough to cash in like this just when I was figuring on going home. Billy couldn't think of anything to say. He turned to look up and down the canyon in search of the enemy. Home, whispered Eddie. Home. Aw, oh, shucks, said Billy kindly. You'll get home all right, kid. The boys must have heard the shooting, and they'll be along in no time now. Then we'll clean up this bunch of coons and have you back in El Robo and nurse into shape in no time. Eddie tried to smile as he looked into the other's face. He reached a hand out and laid it on Billy's arms. You're all right, old man, he whispered. I know you're lying, and so do you. But it makes me feel better anyway to have you say them things. Billy felt as one who had been caught stealing from a blind man. The only adequate reply of which he could think was, Aw, oh, shucks. Say, said Eddie, after a moment's silence, if you get out of here and ever go back to the States, promise me you'll look up Ma and Paul and tell them I was coming home to stay. Tell them I died decent too, will you? Died like Paul was always a telling me when Granddad died, fighting Injuns, round Fort Dodge somewhere. Sure, said Billy, I'll tell them. Gee, look who's coming here, and as he spoke he flattened himself to the ground just as a bullet pinged against a rock above his head, and the report of a rifle sounded from up the canyon. That guy almost got me. I'll have to be tended to business better than this. He drew himself slowly up on his elbows, his carbine ready in his hand, and peered through a small aperture between two of the rocks which composed his breastwork. Then he stuck the muzzle of the weapon through, took aim, and pulled the trigger. Did you get him, asked Eddie? Yep, said Billy, and fired again. Got that one, too. Say, they're tough-looking guys, but I guess they won't be coming so fast next time. These two are right in the open, working up to us on their bellies. They must have thought we was sleeping. For an hour, Billy neither saw nor heard any sign of the enemy, though several times he raised his hat above the breastwork upon the muzzle of the carbine to draw their fire. It was mid-afternoon when the sound of distant rifle fire came faintly to the ears of the two men from somewhere far below them. The boys must be coming, whispered Eddie Shorter, hopefully. For half an hour the firing continued, 
and then silence again fell upon the mountains. Eddie began to wander mentally. He talked much of Kansas and his old home, and many times he begged for water. Buck up, kid, said Billy. The boys will be along in any minute now, and then we'll get you all the water you want. But the boys did not come. Billy was standing up now, stretching his legs, and searching up and down the canyon for Indians. He was wondering if he could chance making a break for the valley where they stood some slight chance of meeting with their companions, and even as he considered the matter seriously, there came a staccato report, and Billy Byrne fell forward in a heap. God, cried Eddie, they got him now, they got him. Byrne stirred and struggled to rise. Like they got me, he said, and staggered to his knees. Over the breastwork he saw a half-dozen Indians running rapidly toward the shelter. He saw them in a haze of red that was caused not by blood, but by anger. With an oath, Billy Byrne leapt to his feet. From his knees up, his whole body was exposed to the enemy, but Billy cared not. He was in a berserker rage. Whipping his carbine to his shoulder, he let drive at the advancing Indians who were now beyond hope of cover. They must come on or be shot down where they were. So they came on, yelling like devils, and stopping momentarily to fire upon the rash white man who stood so perfect a target before them. But their haste spoiled their marksmanship. The bullets zinged and zipped against the rocky little fortress. They nicked Billy's shirt and trousers and hat, and all the while he stood there pumping lead into his assailants, not hysterically, but with the cool deliberation of a butcher slaughtering beeves. One by one the Pimans dropped until but a single Indian rushed frantically upon the white man and then the last of the assailants lunged forward across the breastwork with a bullet from Billy's carbine through his forehead. Eddie Shorter had raised himself painfully upon an elbow that he might witness the battle, but when it was over he sank back, the blood rolling from beneath his set teeth. Billy turned to look at him when the last of the peons was disposed of, and seeing his condition, kneeled beside him and took his head in the hollow of an arm. You order lie still, he cautioned the Kansan. Tain't good for you to move about much. It was worth it, whispered Eddie. Say, but that was some scrap. You got your nerve standing up there against a bunch of em, but if you hadn't, they'd have rushed us and some of us would have gotten it. Funny the boys don't come, said Billy. Yes, replied Eddie, with a sigh. It's milking time now, and I figured on going to Shawnee this evening. Them's nice cookies, Ma. I... Billy Byrne was bending low to catch his feeble words, and when the voice trailed out into nothingness, he lowered the tasseled red head to the hard earth and turned away. Could it be that the thing which glistened on the eyelid of the toughest guy on the west side was a tear? The afternoon waned and night came, but it brought to Billy Byrne neither renewed attack nor succor. The bullet which had dropped him momentarily had but creased his forehead. Aside from the fact that he was blood-covered from the wound, it had inconvenienced him in no way, and now the darkness had fallen, he commenced to plan upon leaving the shelter. First he transferred Eddie's ammunition to his own person and such valuables and trinkets that he thought Maul might be glad to have. Then he removed the breech block from Eddie's carbine and struck it in his pocket that the weapon might be valueless to the Indians when they found it. Sorry I can't bear you, old man, was Billy's parting comment, as he climbed over the breastwork and melted into the night. Billy Byrne moved cautiously through the darkness, and he moved not in the direction of escape and safety, but directly up the canyon in the way of the village of the Pimas lay. Soon he heard the sound of voices and shortly after saw the light of cooked fires, playing upon bronzed faces and upon the fronts of low huts. Some women were moaning and wailing. Billy guessed that they mourned for those whom his billets had found earlier in the day. In the darkness of the night, far upon the rough, forbidding mountains, it was all very weird and uncanny. Billy crept closer to the village. Shelter was abundant. He saw no sign of sentry and wondered why they should be so lax in the face of almost certain attack. Then it occurred to him that possibly the firing he and Eddie had seen earlier in the day, far down among the foothills, might have meant the extermination of the Americans from El Arobo. Well, I'll be next then, mused Billy, and warmed closer to the huts. His eyes were on alert every instance, as were his ears, but no sign of that which he sought rewarded his keenest observation. Until midnight he lay in concealment, and all that time the mourners continued their dismal wailing. Then, one by one, they entered their huts and silence reigned within the village. Billy crept closer. He eyed each hut with longing, wondering gaze. Which could it be? How could he determine? One seemed little more promising than the others. He had noted those to which Indians had retired. There were three into which he had seen none go. These, then, should be the first to undergo his scrutiny. The night was dark. The moon had not yet risen. Only a few dying fires cast a wavering and uncertain light upon the scene. 
Through the shadows Billy Byrne crept closer and closer. At last he lay close behind one of the huts which was to be the first to claim his attention. For several moments he lay listening intently for any sound that would come from within, but there was none. He crawled to the doorway and peered within. Utter darkness shrouded and hid the interior. Billy rose and walked boldly inside. If he could see no one within, then no one could see him once he was inside the door. Therefore, so reasoned Billy Byrne, he would have as good a chance as the occupants of the hut should they prove to be enemies. He crossed the floor carefully, stopping often to listen. At last he heard a rustling sound just ahead of him. His fingers tightened upon the revolver he carried in his right hand, by the barrel, club-like. Billy had no intention of making any more noise than necessary. Again he heard a sound from the same direction. It was not at all unlike a frightened gasp of a woman. Billy emitted the low growl and fair imitation of a prowling dog that had been disturbed. Again the gasp, and a low, go away, in liquid feminine tones, and in English. Billy uttered a low, shh, and tiptoed closer. Extending his hands, they presently came in contact with a human body, which shrank from him with another smothering cry. Barbara, whispered Billy, bending close. A hand reached out through the darkness, found him, and closed upon his sleeve. Who are you? asked in a low voice. Billy, he replied. Are you alone in here? No, an old woman guards me, replied the girl. At the same time, they both heard a movement close at hand, and something scurried past them to be silhouetted for an instant against the path of lesser darkness which marked the location of the doorway. There she goes, cried Barbara. She heard you, and she has gone for help. Then come, said Billy, seizing the girl's arm and dragging her to her feet. But they had scarce crossed half the distance to the doorway, and the cries of the old woman without warned them that the camp had been aroused. Billy thrust a revolver into Barbara's hand. We gotta make a fight of it, little girl, he said, but you'd better die than be here alone. As they emerged from the hut, they saw warriors running from every doorway. The old woman stood, screaming in Piman at the top of her lungs. Billy, keeping Barbara in front of him, that he might shield her body with his own, turned directly out of the village. He did not fire at first, hoping that they might elude detection, and thus not draw the fire of the Indians upon them. But he was doomed to disappointment, and they had taken scarcely a dozen steps when the rifle spoke above the noise of human voices, and a bullet whizzed past them. Then Billy replied, and Barbara, too, from just behind his shoulder. Together they backed away toward the shadow of the trees beyond the village, and as they went, they poured shot after shot into the village. The Indians, but just awakened and still half stupid from sleep, did not know but that they were attacked by a vastly superior force, and this fear held them in check for several minutes, long enough for Billy and Barbara to reach the summit of the bluff from which Billy and Eddie had first been fired upon. Here they were hidden from view of the Indians, and Billy broke at once into a run, half carrying the girl with a strong arm about her waist. If we can reach the foothills, he said, I think we can dodge them, and by going all night we might reach the river and El Robo by morning. It's a long hike, Barbara, but we gotta make it. We gotta, for if the daylight finds us in the Piedmont country, we won't never make it. Anyway, he concluded optimistically, it's all downhill. We'll make it, Billy, she replied, if we can get past the sentry. What sentry? asked Billy. I didn't see no sentry when I come in. They keep a sentry way down the trail all night, replied the girl. In the daytime he is near the village, on top of this bluff, for from here you can see the whole valley. But at night they station him further away, in a narrow part of the trail. It's a mighty good thing you tipped me off, said Billy, for I'd have run right into him. I thought they was all behind us now. After that they went more cautiously, and when they reached the part of the trail where the sentry might be expected to be found, Barbara warned Billy of the fact. Like two thieves they crept along the shadow of the canyon wall. Inwardly Billy cursed the darkness of the night, which hid from view everything more than a few paces from them. Yet it may have been this very darkness which saved them, since it hid them as effectually from an enemy as it hid the enemy from them. They had reached the point where Barbara was positive the sentry should be. The girl was clinging tightly to Billy's left arm. He could feel the pressure of her fingers as they sunk to his muscles, sending little tremors and thrills through his giant frame. Even in the face of death, Billy Byrne could sense the ecstasies of personal contact with this girl, the only woman he had ever loved or ever would. And then a black shadow loomed before him, and a rifle flashed in their faces without a word or a sign of warning. End of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen of The Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. You are my girl. Mr. Anthony Harding was pacing back and forth the length of the veranda of the ranch house at El Robo, waiting for some word of hope from those who had ridden out in search of his daughter, Barbara. Each swirling dust devil that eddied across the dry flat on either side of the river 
roused hopes within his breast that it might have been spurred into activity by the hooves of a pony bearing a messenger of good tidings but always his hopes were dashed for no horseman emerged from the he's hate of the distance where the little dust devils raced playfully among the cacti and the greasewood but at last in the northwest a horseman unheralded by gyrating dust column came into sight mr harding shook his head sorrowfully it had not been from this direction that he had expected word of barbara yet he kept his eyes fastened upon the rider until the latter reined in at the ranch yard and loped a tired and sweating pony to the foot of the veranda steps then mr harding saw who the newcomer was bridge he exclaimed what brings you back here don't you know that you endanger us as well as yourself by being seen here general villa will think that we have been harboring you bridge swung from the saddle and ran up to the veranda he paid not the slightest attention to anthony harding's protest how many men you got here you can depend on he asked none replied the easterner what do you mean none cried bridge incredulity and hopelessness showing upon his countenance isn't there a chinaman and a couple faithful mexicans oh yes of course assented mr harding but what are you driving at peseda is on his way here to clean up el robo he can't be very far behind me call the men you got and we'll get together all the guns and ammunition on the ranch and barricade the ranch house we may be able to stand them off have you heard anything of miss barbara anthony harding shook his head sadly then we'll have to stay right here and do the best we can said bridge i was thinking we might make a run for it if miss barbara was here but as she's not we must wait for those who went after her mr harding summoned the two mexicans while bridge ran to the cookhouse and ordered the chinaman to the ranch house then the erstwhile bookkeeper ransacked the bunkhouse for arms and ammunition what little he found he carried to the ranch house and with the help of the others barricaded the doors and windows of the first floor we'll have to make our fight from the upper windows he explained to the ranch owner if peseda doesn't bring too large a force we may be able to stand them off until we can get help from Quivaca call up there now and see if you can get villa to send help he ought to protect us from peseta i understand there's no love lost between the two anthony harding went at once to the telephone and rang for the central at Quivaca. tell it to the operator shouted bridge who stood peering through the opening in the barricade before a front window they're coming now and the chances are that the first thing they'll do is cut the telephone wires the easterner poured his story and appeal for help into the ears of the girl at the other end of the line and then for a few moments there was silence in the room as he listened to her reply impossible and my god it can't be true bridge heard the older man ejaculate and then he saw him hang up the receiver and turn from the instrument his face drawn and pinched with an expression of utter hopelessness what's wrong asked bridge villa has turned against the americans replied harding dully the operator evidently feels friendly toward us for she warned me not to appeal to villa and told me why even now this minute the man has a force of twenty five hundred ready to march on columbus new mexico three americans were hanged in Quivaca this afternoon it's horrible sir it's horrible we are all as good as dead this very minute even if we stand off peseta we can never escape to the border through villa's forces it looks bad admitted bridge in fact it couldn't look much worse but here we are and while our ammunition holds out all we can do is stay here and use it will you men stand by us he addressed the chinaman and the two mexicans who assured him that they had no love for peseta and would fight for anthony harding in preference to going over to the enemy good exclaimed bridge and now for upstairs they'll be howling around here in about five minutes we want to give them a reception they won't forget he led the way to the second floor where the five took up positions near the front windows a short distance from the ranch house they could see the enemy consisting of a detachment of some twenty of peseda's troopers riding at a brisk trot in their direction peseda's with them announced bridge presently he's the little fellow on the sorrel wait until they are close up then give them a few rounds but go easy on the ammunition we haven't any too much Peseda, expecting no resistance, rode boldly into the ranch yard. At the bunkhouse in the office his little force halted while three or four troopers dismounted and entered the buildings in search of victims. Disappointed there, they moved toward the ranch house. Lie low, Bridge cautioned his companions. Don't let them see you, and wait till I give the word before you fire. On came the horsemen at a slow walk. Bridge waited until they were within a few yards of the house, then he cried, Now let him have it! A rattle of rifle fire broke from the upper windows into the ranks of the pesatistas three troopers reeled and slipped from their saddles two horses dropped in their tracks cursing and yelling the balance of the horsemen wheeled and galloped away in the direction of the office building followed by the fire of the defenders that wasn't so bad cried bridge i'll venture a guess that mr peseda is some surprised and sore there they will go behind the office they'll stay there a few minutes talking it over and giving up their courage to try it again next time they'll come from another direction you two he continued turning to the mexicans take positions on the east and the south sides of the house 
Sing can remain here with Mr. Harding. I'll take the north side, facing the office. Shoot at the first man who shows his head. If we can hold them off until dark, we may be able to get away. Whatever happens, don't let one of them get close enough to fire the house. That's what they'll try for. It was fifteen minutes before the second attack came. Five dismounted troopers made a dash for the north side of the house, but when Bridge dropped the first of them before he had taken ten steps from the office building and wounded the second, the others retreated for shelter. Time and again, as the afternoon wore away, Peseta made attempts to get men close up to the house, but in each instance they were driven back, until at last they desisted from their efforts to fire the house or rush it, and contented themselves with firing occasional shot through the windows opposite them. They're waiting for dark, said Bridge to Mr. Harding during a temporary lull in the hostilities, and then were goners unless the boys come back from across the river in time. "'Couldn't we get away after dark?' asked the Easterner. "'It's our only hope if help don't reach us,' replied Bridge. But when the night finally fell and the five men made an attempt to leave the house upon the side away from the office building, they were met with the flash of carbines and the ping of bullets. One of the Mexican defenders fell, mortally wounded, and the others were barely able to drag him in and replace the barricade before the door when five of Peseda's men charged close up to their defenses. These were finally driven off, and again there came a lull. But all hopes of escape was gone, and Bridge reposted the defenders at the upper windows, where they might watch every approach to the house. As the hours dragged on, the hopelessness of their position grew upon the minds of all. Their ammunition was almost gone. Each man had but a few rounds remaining, and it was evident that Peseta, through an inordinate desire for revenge, would persist until he had reduced their fortress and claimed the last of them as his victims. It was with such cheerful expectations that they awaited the final assault which would see them without ammunition and defenseless in the face of the cruel and implacable foe. It was just before daylight when the anticipated rush occurred. From every side rang the reports of carbines and the yells of the bandits. There were scarcely more than a dozen of the original twenty left, but they made up for their depleted numbers by the rapidity which they worked their firearms and the loudness and ferocity of the savage cries. And this time they reached the shelter of the veranda and commenced battering at the door. At the report of the rifle so close to them, Billy Byrne shoved Barbara quickly to one side and leapt forward to close with the man who barred their way to liberty. That they had surprised him even more than he had them was evidenced by the wildness of his shot which passed harmlessly above their heads, as well as by the fact that he had permitted them to come so close before engaging them. To the latter event was attributable his undoing, for it permitted Billy Byrne to close with him before the Indian could reload his antiquated weapon. Down the two men went, the American on top, each striving for a death hold. But in weight and strength and skill the Piman was far outclassed by the trained fighter, a part of whose daily workouts had consisted in wrestling with proficient artists of the mat. Barbara Harding ran forward to assist her champion, but as the men rolled and tumbled over the ground, she could find no opening for a blow that might not endanger Billy Byrne quite as much as it endangered his antagonist. But presently she discovered that the American required no assistance. She saw the Indian's head bending slowly forward beneath the resistless force of the other's huge muscles. She heard the crack that announced the parting of the vertebrae, and saw the limp thing which had but a moment before been a man, pulsing with life and vigor, roll helplessly aside, a harmless and inanimate lump of clay. Billy Byrne leapt to his feet, shaking himself as a great mastiff might whose coat had been ruffled in a fight. Come, he whispered, we gotta beat it now for sure. That guy shot'll lead him right down to us. And once more they took up their flight down toward the valley, along an unknown trail through the darkness of the night. For the most part they moved in silence. Billy holding the girl's arm or hand to steady her over the rough and dangerous portions of the path, and as they went, there grew in Billy's breast a love so deep and so resistless that he found himself wondering that he had ever imagined that his former passion for this girl was love. This new thing surged through him and over him, with all the blind, brutal, compelling force of a mighty tidal wave. It battered down and swept away the frail barriers of his newfound gentleness. Again he was the mucker, hating the artificial wall of social caste which separated him from the girl, and now he was ready to climb the wall or better still, to batter it down with his huge fists. But the time was not yet. First he must get Barbara to a place of safety. On and on they went. The night grew cold. Far ahead there sounded the occasional pop of a rifle. Billy wondered what it could mean, and as they approached the ranch, he discovered that it came from that direction. He hastened their steps to even greater speed than before. "'Somebody's shooting up at the ranch,' he volunteered. "'Wonder who it could be. Suppose it is your friend in general?' asked the girl. Billy made no reply. They reached the river, and as Billy knew not where the fords lay, he plunged in at the point which the water first barred their progress, and dragging the girl after him, plowed bull-like for the opposite shore. Where water was above his depth, he swam while Barbara clung to his shoulders. Thus they made the passage quickly and safely. Billy stopped long enough to shake the water out of his carbine, which the girl had carried across, and then forged ahead toward the ranch house, from which the sounds of battle came now in increasing volume. 
and at the ranch house hell was popping. The moment Bridge realized that some of the attackers had reached the veranda, he called the surviving Mexican and the Chinaman to follow him to the lower floor, where they might stand a better chance to repel this new attack. Mr. Harding he persuaded to remain upstairs. Outside a dozen men were battering to force an entrance. Already one panel had splintered, and as Bridge entered the room he could see the figures of the bandits through the hole they had made. Raising his rifle, he fired through the aperture. There was a scream as one of the attackers dropped, but the others only increased their efforts, their oaths, and their threats of vengeance. The three defenders poured a few rounds through the sagging door. Then Bridge noted that the Chinaman ceased firing. "'What's the matter?' he asked. "'Ollie Goni,' replied Singh, pointing to the ammunition belt. At the same instant the Mexican threw down his carbine and rushed for a window on the opposite side of the room. His ammunition was exhausted, and with it had departed his courage. Flight only seemed the only course remaining. Bridge made no effort to stop him. He would have been glad to fly, too, but he could not leave Anthony Harding, and he was sure that the older man would prove unequal to any sustained flight on foot. "'You better go, too, Singh,' he said to the Chinaman, placing another bullet through the door. "'There's nothing more that you can do, and it may be that they are all on this side now. I think they are. You fellows have fought splendidly. Wish I can give you something more substantial than thanks, but that's all I have now, and shortly Peseta won't even leave me that much.' all light replied singh cheerfully and a second later he was clambering through the window in the wake of the loyal mexican and then the door crashed in and half a dozen troopers followed by peseta himself burst into the room bridge was standing at the foot of the stairs his carbine clubbed for he had just spent his last bullet he knew that he must die but he was determined to make them purchase his life as dearly as he could and to die in defense of anthony harding the father of the girl he loved even though hopelessly peseta saw from the american's attitude that he had no more ammunition he struck up the carbine of a trooper who was about to shoot Bridge down. Wait, commanded the bandit. Cease firing. His ammunition is gone. Will you surrender? he asked of Bridge. Not until I've beaten the heads of one or two of your friends, he replied. That which their egotism leads them to imagine our brains. No, if you take me alive, Peseta, they'll have to kill me to do it. Peseta shrugged. Very well, he said indifferently. It makes little difference to me. That stairway is as good as a wall. These brave defenders of the liberty of poor, bleeding Mexico will make an excellent firing squad. Attention, my children. Ready? Aim. Eleven carbines were leveled at bridge. In the ghastly light of early dawn, the sallow complexions of the Mexicans took on a weird hue. The American made a wry face. A slight shudder shook his slender frame, and then he squared his shoulders and looked Peseta smilingly in the face. The figure of a man appeared at the window through which the Chinaman and the loyal Mexican had escaped. Quick eyes took in the scene within the room. Hey, he yelled, cut the rough stuff, and leaped into the room. Peseda, surprised by the interruption, turned toward the intruder before he had given the command to fire. A smile lit his features when he saw who it was. Ah, he exclaimed, my dear Captain Byrne, just in time to see a traitor and a spy pay the penalty for his crimes. Nothing doing, growled Billy Byrne, and then he threw his carbine to his shoulder and took careful aim at Peseda's face. How easy it would have been to have hesitated the moment in the window before he made his presence known just long enough for Peseta to speak the single word that would have sent eleven bullets speeding into the body of the man who loved Barbara, and whom Billy believed the girl loved. But did such a thought occur to Billy Byrne of Grand Avenue? It did not. He forgot every other consideration beyond his loyalty to a friend. Bridge and Peseta were looking at him in wide-eyed astonishment. "'Lay down your carbines,' Billy shot his command at the firing squad. "'Lay em down, or I'll bore Peseta. "'Tell him to lay em down, Peseta. "'I got a beat on your beezer.' Peseta did as he was bid." his yellow face pasty with rage. "'Now the cartridge belts,' snapped Billy, and when these had been deposited upon the floor, he told Bridge to disarm the bandit chief. "'Is Mr. Harding safe?' he asked of Bridge, and receiving an affirmative, he called upstairs for the older man to descend. As Mr. Harding reached the foot of the stairs, Barbara entered the room by the window through which Billy had come, a window which opened upon the side veranda. "'Now we got a hike,' announced Billy. "'It will never be safe for none of you here after this, not even if you think Villa's your friend, which he ain't the friend of no American.' We know that now, said Mr. Harding, and repeated to Billy that which the telephone operator had told him earlier in the day. Marching Peseta and his men ahead of them, Billy and the others made their way to the rear of the office building, where the horses of the bandits were tethered. They were each armed now from the discarded weapons of the raiders, and well supplied with ammunition. The Chinaman and the loyal Mexican also discovered themselves when they learned the tables had been turned upon Peseta. They too were armed and all were mounted, and when Billy had loaded the remaining weapons upon the balance of the horses, the party rode away driving Peseta's livestock and arms ahead of them. "'I imagine,' remarked Bridge, "'that you've rather discouraged pursuit for a while at least, but pursuit came sooner than they had anticipated.' 
They had reached a point on the river not far from Jose's when a band of horsemen appeared approaching from the west. Billy urged his party to greater speed that they might avoid meeting, if possible, but it soon became evident that the strangers had no intention of permitting them to go unchallenged, for they altered their course and increased their speed, so that they were soon bearing down upon the fugitives at a rapid gallop. "'I guess,' said Billy, "'that we'd better open up on them. It's a cinch they ain't no friends of ours anywhere in these parts.' "'Hadn't we better wait a moment?' said Mr. Harding. "'We do not want a chance making any mistake.' "'It ain't never a mistake to shoot a dago,' replied Billy. His eyes were fastened upon the approaching horseman, and he presently gave an exclamation of recognition. "'There's Rosales,' he said. "'I couldn't mistake that beanpole nowheres. We're safe enough in taking a shot at him if Rosie's with him. He's Pesita's head guy, and he drew his revolver and took a single shot in the direction of his former comrade. Bridge followed his example. The oncoming Pesitistas reined in. Billy returned his revolver to its holster and drew his carbine. "'You ride on ahead,' he said to Mr. Harding and Barbara. Bridge and I'll bring up the rear. Then he stopped his pony, and turning, took deliberate aim at the knot of horsemen to their left. A bandit tumbled from his saddle, and the fight was on. Fortunately for the Americans, Rosales had but a handful of men with him, and Rosales himself was never keen for a fight in the open. All morning he hovered around the rear of the escaping Americans, but neither side did much damage to the other, and during the afternoon Billy noticed that Rosales merely followed within sight of them, after having dispatched one of the men back in the direction from which they had come. After reinforcements, commented Byrne, all day they rode without meeting with any roving bands of soldiers or bandits, and the explanation was all too sinister to the Americans, when coupled with the knowledge that Villa was to attack an American town that night. "'I wish we could reach the border in time to warn them,' said Billy. "'But they ain't no chance. If we cross before sun-up tomorrow morning, we'll be doing well.' He had scarcely spoken to Barbara Harding all day, for his duties as rear guard had kept him busy, nor had he conversed much with Bridge, though he had often eyed the latter, whose gaze wandered many times to the slender, graceful figure of the girl ahead of them. Billy was thinking as he had never had thought before. It seemed to him a cruel fate that so shaped their destinies that his best friend loved the girl Billy loved. That Bridge was ignorant of Billy's infatuation for her, the latter knew well. He could not blame Bridge, nor could he, upon the other hand, quite reconcile himself to the more than apparent adoration which marked his friend's attitude toward Barbara. As daylight waned, the fugitives realized from the shuffling gait of their mounts, from drooping heads and dull eyes, that rest was imperative. They themselves were fagged, too, and when a ranch house loomed in front of them, they decided to halt for much-needed recuperation. Here they found three Americans who were totally unaware of Villa's contemplated raid across the border, and who, when they were informed of it, were doubly glad to welcome six extra carbines, for Barbara not only was armed, but was eminently qualified to expand ammunition without wasting it. Rosales and his small band halted out of range of the ranch, but they went hungry while the quarry fed themselves and their tired mounts. The Clark brothers and their cousin, a man by the name of Mason, who were the sole inhabitants of the ranch, counseled a long rest two hours at least, for the border was still ten miles away, and speed at the last moment might be their sole means of salvation. Billy was for moving on at once before the reinforcements, for which he had been sure Rosales had dispatched his messenger, could overtake them. But the others were tired, and argued, too, that upon jaded ponies they could not hope to escape, and so they waited until, just as they were ready to continue their flight, flight became impossible. Darkness had fallen when the little party commenced to resaddle their ponies, and in the midst of their labors there came a rude and disheartening interruption. Billy had kept either the Chinaman or Bridge constantly upon watch toward the direction in which Rosales's men lolled smoking in the dark, and it was the crack of Bridge's carbine which awoke the Americans to the fact that though the border lay but a few miles away, they were still far from safety. As he fired, Bridge turned in his saddles and shouted to the others to make for the shelter of the ranch house. "'There are two hundred of them,' he cried. "'Run for cover!' Billy and the Clark brothers leapt to their saddles, and spurred toward the point where Bridge sat pumping lead into the advancing enemy. Mason and Mr. Harding hurried Barbara to the questionable safety of the ranch house. The Mexican followed them, and Bridge ordered Singh back to assist in barricading the doors and windows, while he and Billy and the Clark boys held the bandits in momentary check. Falling back slowly and firing constantly as they came, the four approached the house, while Peseda and his full band advanced cautiously after them. They had almost reached the house when Bridge lunged forward from his saddle. The Clark boys had dismounted and were leading the ponies inside the house. Billy alone noted the wounding of his friend. Without an instant's hesitation, he slipped from his saddle, ran back to where Bridge lay, and lifted him in his arms. Bolts were pattering thick about them. A horseman far in advance of his fellows galloped forward with drawn saber to cut down the gringos. Billy, casting an occasional glance behind, saw the danger in time to meet it, just, in fact, as the weapon was cutting through the air toward his head. Dropping Bridge and dodging to one side, he managed to escape the cut but before the swordsman could recover, Billy had leapt to his pony's side and seized the rider about the waist, dragging him to the ground. 
Rosales, he exclaimed, and struck the man as he had never struck another in all his life, with the full force of his mighty muscles backed by his great weight, with clenched fists full to the face. There was a spurting of blood and splintering of bone, and Captain Guillermo Rosales sank senselessly to the ground. His career of crime and rapine ended forever. Again Billy lifted Bridge in his arms, and this time he succeeded in reaching the ranch house without opposition, though a little crimson stream trickled down his left arm to drop upon the face of his friend, and he deposited Bridge upon the floor of the house. All night the Pesatistas circled the lone ranch house. All night they poured their volleys into the adobe walls and through the barricaded windows. All night the little band of defenders fought gallantly for their lives, but as day approached the futility of their endeavors was borne in upon them, for of the nine one was dead and three wounded and the number of the assailants seemed undiminished. Billy Byrne had been lying all night upon his stomach before a window, firing into the darkness at the dim forms which occasionally showed against the dull, dead background of the moonless desert. Presently he leapt to his feet and crossed the floor to the room in which the horses had been placed. Everyone fired toward the rear of the house, as fast as they can, said Billy. I want a clear space for my getaway. Where are you going? asked one of the Clark brothers. North, replied Billy, after some of Funston's men on the border. But they won't cross, said Mr. Harding. Washington won't let them. They got us, snapped Billy Byrne, and they will when they know there's an American girl here with a bunch of dagos yapping around. You'll be killed, said Price Clark. You can't never get through. Leave it to me, replied Billy. Just get ready and open that back door when I give the word, and then shut it again in a hurry when I've gone through. He led a horse from the side room and mounted it. Open her up, bows, he shouted. So long, everybody. Price Clark swung the door open. Billy put spurs to his mount and threw himself forward flat against the animal's neck. Another moment he was through, and a rattling fusillade of shots proclaimed the fact that his bold feet had not gone unnoted by the foe. The little Mexican pony shot like a bolt from a crossbow out across the level desert. The rattling of carbines only served to add speed to his frightened feet. Billy sat erect in the saddle, guiding the horse with his left hand, and working his revolver methodically with his right. At a window behind him, Barbara Harding stood breathless and spellbound until he disappeared into the gloom of the early morning darkness to the north. Then she turned with a weary sigh and resumed her place beside the wounded bridge whose head she bathed with cool water, while he tossed in a delirium of fever. The first streaks of daylight were piercing the heavens. The Pesatistas were rallying for a decisive charge. The hopes of the little band of besieged were at low ebb when from the west there sounded the pounding of many hooves. Via, moaned Weston Clark, hopelessly. We're done for now, sure enough. He must be coming back from his raid on the border. In the faint light of dawn they saw a column of horsemen deployed suddenly into a long, thin line which galloped forward over the flat earth, coming toward them like a huge, relentless engine of destruction. The Pesatistas were watching, too. They had ceased firing and sat in their saddles, forgetful of their contemplated charge. The occupants of the ranch house were gathered at the small windows. "'What's them?' cried Mason. "'Them things floating over them. "'They're Giddens,' exclaimed Price Clark. "'The Giddens of the United States Cavalry Regiment. "'See em? See em? "'God, but don't they look good!' There was a wild whoop from the lungs of the advancing cavalrymen. Pasita's troops answered it with a scattering volley, and a moment later the Americans were among them in that famous revolver charge which is now history. Dillett had come revealing to the watchers in the ranch house the figures of the combatants. In the thick of the fight loomed the giant figure of a man in nondescript garb, which more closely resembled the apparel of Pesatistas than it did the uniforms of the American soldiery. Yet it was with them he fought. Barbara's eyes were the first to detect him. "'There's Mr. Byrne,' she cried. "'It must have been he who brought the troops.' Why, he hasn't had time to reach the border yet, remonstrated one of the Clark boys, much less get back here with him. There he is, though, said Mr. Harding. It's certainly strange. I can't understand that American troops are doing across the border, especially under the present administration. The Pesatistas held their ground for but a moment when they wheeled and fled, but not before Peseta himself had forced his pony close to that of Billy Byrne. Traitor, screamed the bandit, you shall die for this, and fired point blank at the American. Billy felt the burning sensation in his already wounded left arm, but his right was still good. For poor, bleeding Mexico, he cried, and put a bullet through Pesada's forehead. Under escort of the men of the 30th Cavalry who had pursued Villa's raiders into Mexico, and upon whom Billy Byrne had stumbled by chance, the little party of fugitives came safely to United States soil, where all but one breathed sighs of heartfelt relief. Bridge was given first aid by the members of the hospital corps, who assured Billy that his friend would not die. Mr. Harding and Barbara were taken in by the wife of an officer, and it was at the quarters of the latter that Billy Byrne found her alone in the sitting room. The girl looked up as he entered, a sad smile upon her face. She was about to ask him of his wound, but he gave her no opportunity. "'I've come for you,' he said. "'I gave you up once when I thought it was better for you to marry a man in your own class. I won't give you up again. You're mine. You're my girl. I'm going to take you with me. We're going to Galveston as fast as we can. 
and from there we're going to Rio. You belonged to me long before Bridge saw you. He can't have you. Nobody can have you but me. And if anyone tries to keep me from taking you, they'll get killed. He took a step nearer that brought him close to her. She did not shrink, only looked up into his face with wide eyes filled with wonder. He seized her roughly in his arms. You're my girl, he cried hoarsely. Kiss me. Wait, she said. First tell me what you mean by saying that Bridge couldn't have me. I never knew that Bridge wanted me, and I certainly never wanted Bridge. Oh, Billy, why didn't you do this long ago? Months ago in New York I wanted you to take me, but you left me to another man whom I didn't love. I thought you had ceased to care, Billy, and since we had been together here, since that night in the room back in the office, you have made me feel that I was nothing to you. Take me, Billy. Take me anywhere in the world that you go. I love you, and I'll slave for you. Anything, just to be with you. Barbara, cried Billy Byrne, and then his voice was smothered by the pressure of warm, red lips against his own. A half hour later, Billy stepped out into the street to make his way to the railroad station that he might procure transportation for three to Galveston. Anthony Harding was going with them. He had listened to Barbara's pleas, and had finally volunteered to back Billy Byrne's flight from the jurisdiction of the law, or at least to a place where, under a new name, he could start life over again and live it as the son-in-law of old Anthony Harding should live. Among the crowd viewing the havoc wrought by the raiders the previous night was a large man with a red face. It happened that he turned suddenly about as Billy Byrne was on the point of passing behind him. Both men started as recognition lighted their faces, and he of the red face found himself looking down the barrel of a six-shooter. "'Put it up, Byrne,' he admonished the other coolly. "'I didn't know you were so good on the draw.' "'I'm good on the draw, all right, Flanagan,' said Billy, "'and I ain't drawn for amusement neither. I got a chance to get away and live straight, and have a little happiness in life. And Flanagan, the man who tries to crab my name, is going to get himself croaked. I'm never going back to stir alive, you see?' "'Yep,' said Flanagan. "'I see. But I ain't trying to crab your game. I ain't down here after you this trip. Where you been, anyway, that you didn't know the war's over? Why, Coke Sheehan confessed a month ago that it was him that croaked Schneider, and the governor pardoned you about ten days ago. "'You stringing me?' asked Billy, a vicious glint in his eyes. "'On a level,' Flanagan assured him. "'Wait, I got a clipping from the trip in my clothes somewhere that gives all the dope.' He drew back some papers from his coat pocket and handed one to Billy. "'Turn your back and hold up your hands while I read,' said Byrne and as Flanagan did as he was bid, Billy unfolded the soiled bit of newspaper and read that which set him a-trembling with nervous excitement. A moment later, Detective Sergeant Flanagan ventured a rearward glance to note how Byrne received the joyful tidings which the newspaper article contained. "'Well, I'll be!' ejaculated the sleuth, for Billy Byrne was already a hundred yards away and breaking all records in his dash for the sitting-room he had quitted but a few minutes before. It was a happy and contented trio who took the train the following day on their way back to New York City, after bidding Bridge goodbye in the improvised hospital and exacting his promise that he would visit them in New York in the near future. It was a month later. Spring was filling the Southland with new, sweet life. The joy of living was reflected in the song of birds and the opening of buds. Beside a slow-moving stream, a man squatted before a tiny fire. A battered tin can, half filled with water, stood close to the burning embers. Upon a sharpened stick, the man roasted a bit of meat and as he watched it curling at the edges as the flame licked it, he spoke aloud, though there was none to hear. Just for a con I'd like to know, yes, he crossed over long ago. And he was right, believe me, Bo, if somewhere in the south, down where the clouds lie on the sea, he found a sweet Penelope, with buds of roses in her hair and kisses on her mouth. Which is what they'll be singing about me one of these days, he commented. End of chapter 17 End of The Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs